Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is uh, Mark Tobin. And uh, normally I wouldn't run through a couple of slides, but I'm having a small technical issue this morning. So we're going to skip uh, the slides from me and we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter, Chantelle Millard from Maggie Beer Holdings. Uh, Chantelle, if you want to start your uh, audio there now, take yourself off mute and uh, we're good to go. Okay, no problem. I'm on mute, am I? Yeah, I don't think so. Very perfect, you can yeah. hear me? Yeah, perfect. perfect. <laughs> Excellent. No problem. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me for the presentation this morning. As Mark mentioned, I'm Chantal Millard. I'm the CEO and Managing Director of Maggie Beer Holdings. So to start with, what I'll do is I'm just going to run through uh, a quick timeline of the Maggie Beer Holdings Group. Um, some people um, will be aware of the businesses in the group and some people may not be. So I joined the Maggie Beer Products business when it was Maggie Beer Products back in April 2015 and was involved in the first sale of the 48% of the Maggie Beer Products business into what was then the primary opinion or pop uh, group, which was a listed company. Uh, in 2017, a managing director was appointed to uh, primary opinion. Um, YSTAR was still running Maggie Beer Products and they purchased BD Farm Paris Creek um, or Paris Creek Farms, which is a biodynamic organic dairy based here in the Adelaide Hills in South Australia. It's the largest um, biodynamic organic dairy in Australia. Um, and predominantly at the moment, it sells uh, mostly in South Australia, although we have just one quite a large contract um, across the Eastern seaboard. It produces milk, yogurt, cheese, and quark and butter, and um, is, a, is a premium dairy facility. Uh, in 2017, after that acquisition, they changed the name of the company to Long Table Group, which some of you would be familiar with. And then in August 2018, they purchased the micro dairy, St. David Dairy, in, in August 2018, which is based in Fitzroy in Melbourne. This is a single source dairy, again, a very premium dairy, loved by baristas, has a very loyal following and um, fantastic brand. Um, it also sells into New South Wales now and does milk, yogurt and butter. They're the key products there. In April 2019, after using the capital to rebuild and to grow out the Maggie Beer products business, the remaining 52% of the shares were sold into the long table group. So Maggie Beer products was a 100% owned business of that group as well. So there were the three businesses in the long table group. In October 2019, the managing director stepped down from Long Table Group and I took over the CEO role and um, as an acting CEO and became the fully fledged CEO in November 2019. We started, I guess, the transformation of the Maggie, the, the Long Table Group, it was, as it was known then from that date. And in, there was a bit of um, board um, uh, transition in as well. And um, we had a new chairman start in March 2020. Um, and together we have been rebuilding the, the Maggie Beer Holdings Group to where it is today. In July 2020, we changed the name to be Maggie Beer Holdings. Um, we believe that that was more, um, uh, it represented better what the group was, which is now three pre premium food businesses, um, which is Australian produce um, and supported local farmers. And so that's why we changed it to be Maggie Beer Holdings. In May 2021, we purchased Hampers and Gifts Australia. So the just some of the reasoning behind this, which I'll explain now, is that the, the group was predominantly in retail with approximately 90% of its, of its sales in, in retail. So Maggie Beer products um, were selling nationally um, through Coles, Woolworths, and all the independents, um, as Paris Creek Farms and mainly South Australia. And St. David Dairy was predominantly food service with about 25% retail. So we also saw the strength in the direct consumer and the e-commerce channel that Maggie Beer products had. It was growing its Maggie, its um, e-commerce channel quite rapidly um, over the 18 months preceding to that. And so a decision was made that we would look to, to grow that direct to consumer business. And um, we started on that journey. The business of Hampers and Gifts Australia came across our desk in January 2021, uh, and it really ticked all of those boxes of um, a fantastic direct to consumer business. To give it some scale, that business uh, would sell approximately 260,000 hampers in that 12 months, and this year it will do about 350,000 hampers in gifting. Um, it had a fantastic in house digital marketing team um, and a state of the art. Um, 
distribution centre. So it would really give us the ability to put the Maggie Beer products business um, into that model as well to grow that direct to consumer business. Um, and also had a huge audience as we did to talk to. We're, together we've got about 940,000 consumers that we talked to through food clubs, um, our social media channels. And so it was a really powerful um, combination of the two businesses. The Herbs and Gifts Australia business also had a premium uh, alcohol brand in it, which was the LMVH with uh, Moe um, and Krug. Um, it, it didn't have a premium food offer. So it also would give us the opportunity to put the Maggie Beer Products branded products across the Hampers and Gifts Australia business. For example, Hampers and Gifts Australia um, included 100,000 units of quince paste in its hampers that weren't Maggie Beer branded. So immediately we were able to switch those out and put them across the uh, Hampers and Gifts Australia range. I'll talk a little bit more about the integration um, in a moment, um, but the integration has gone really, really smoothly and we've been able to get the Maggie Beer products um, products across the Hampers and Gibbs Australia range ready for this large Christmas sales that we're doing at the moment. So the deal made a lot of sense and was able to allow us to really accelerate the, our growth in that direct to consumer channel and to give it some scale. Um, the, after the first quarter, about 40% of the Maggie Beer Holdings business is now in that direct to consumer e-commerce channel um, versus 90% as it was. So it's really diversified our revenue stream um, and allowed us to have that greater audience um, and a lot more touch points across the group. So looking at the key 2021 20, financial takeaway, so the FY20 really created a, a clear path of sustained earnings and revenue growth um, for us. We saw 18.8% net sales growth, um, together with 177% growth in our EBITDA year on year. We had achieved a positive impact for the first time as a, as a food group, which of $1.9 million. We saw an increase in our gross margin of $3.6 million. As I mentioned, our trading EBITDA was improved by 177% up to $3.1 million, and we had a strong balance sheet of $13.5 million in cash. After the transaction um, of, of Hammers and Gifts Australia, if the Hammers and Gifts Australia had been owned 100% by Maggie B Holdings for that, that full year, um, the group sales would have been $86.7 million and an EBITDA of about $12 million. Um, so it really shows the growth in the scale um, that, that the group was now achieving. So the acquisition of HGA was already delivering benefits. Um, the, the business is fully integrated um, into the group after we purchased it in May. The mar digital marketing team was fully handed over and um, was combined from the 1st of July. We've implemented a new ERP system. We've fully redone the Maggie Beer products hamper range. We've also developed new hampers for Hampers Against Australia using some of our Maggie Beer products. Um, we've been able to relocate the full pick and pack and customer service up to Sydney. That happened at the end of July. So the Maggie Beer Products e-commerce is now being fully run out of Sydney by the HGA and Maggie Beer Products team, uh, which is fantastic. And it's already delivering amazing results, which I'll um, touch on further. So the key areas of growth that we see is that we've got um, ability to expand our core range out a lot further in the Australian and export markets. We will continue to develop new products, um, which we do very well. We're very nimble and um, have great ability to do that. Um, we're going to be increasing the marketing um, in, and increasing our brand presence through increased marketing activities. And we'll also be continuing to refine our efficiencies and our operations to ensure we continue to have strong gross margins. So just having a look at FY21. Um, if we looked at it purely on a Q1 FY21 versus Q1 um, uh, FY22 basis, we've seen 84.1% growth in sales. Uh, and if we look at it on a pro rata basis, by assuming we owned the Heavens and Gives Australia business last year, we've seen a 24.8% increase in net sales in that first quarter, which is really amazing off of the high base that we had um, the previous year. The e-commerce sales have continued to grow and are now increased by 66% at the end of Q1 and the balance sheet, strong balance sheet, our cash is still very strong. We saw an increase in our cash by $1.18 million and that's off the back of and us investing in quite a large amount of working capital um, in the lead up to Christmas for all of the businesses. Looking at them individually, Maggie Beer products continued to drive growth with 26.2% increase in sales in Q1 
Uh, its e-commerce grew by 154% in Q1, which is off the um, increases that we had the previous year, which is just showing the benefits already coming through for the um, implementation of the HGA model. Paris Creek Farms growth was flat, uh, but we do have new business coming through for that um, from March 22, which I'll touch on later. St. David Dairy um, continued to perform strongly, even though it was in lockdown in Melbourne for um, yeah, almost for the past two years, it continued to grow off the previous quarter in the same uh, last year uh, when it was in lockdown by 8.7%. And Herbs and Gifts Australia amazingly had 63% growth off of the already inflated um, growth the previous year, which really does show that the that uh, COVID did set a new base um, in FY21 and we're continuing to grow off of that. So looking at Maggie Beer products, um, so it had this 26% increase in sales, which was 154% increase in its e-commerce sales. But pleasingly, we also saw the retail grocery sales up by 21.3% um, in the first quarter of this financial year. Um, we've been able to launch the new hamper range and create new videography um, for the hamper range, which is really generating extra growth in Q2, um, FY22 as well. We've launched our new bone broths in sept September 21, which is selling well. And we've also launched our new finishing source range, um, which is now selling well over Christmas. Our core ranges of cheese, um, fruit paste and pate, um, they are continuing to increase and they are looking strong going into Christmas. And we've created some new TVCs that we'll be launching um, on free to air and demand channels this weekend, actually, which will look fantastic for our new bone broths and finishing source ranges. So we've seen some really good growth in our Maggie Beer products e-commerce. Um, with our website visits up by 51%, our total consumers increasing by 122%, our repeat customer rates now 30%, um, and our food club members now hitting over 70,000 members. So this is, again, is the, the firepower, I guess, that we've got now with that in-house digital marketing team um, that we um, purchased with the HGA transaction. Some of our new products that we've launched, I'll just quickly flick over those. And also just some of the new imagery for that new hamper range um, that's really growing our sales. So moving on to Hampers and Gifts Australia, um, as mentioned, um, HGA has had excellent growth with its e-commerce growing um, by 63% in Q1 FY21, and the growth is continuing into Q2 as well. It launched its new Christmas hamper range, as well as its updated everyday hamper range with our Maggie Beer products included, as well as some new baby hampers. And um, it also implemented its new customer data platform in July, which is allowing greater personalization tools, which are really powerful to increase shopping frequency and repeat purchase rates. Um, it also created new beautiful new photography, and we've also set up multiple delivery options, um, which will allow us to sell right up until Christmas with door-to-door -door delivery outside of the Australia Post system, um, which will give us rapid delivery um, for consumers, which will really push um, in the, the following weeks coming up to Christmas so that consumers continue to purchase in confidence. And, and one of the other things I think you're pointing out is that both the Maggie View Products business and the HGA business um, have got, we've we are, uh, we are stocked up and we are selling through, but we, we're going to have ample stock for Christmas, um, and which is great. We, um, we won't be running out of inventory after bringing it in nice and early. Again, growth drivers, I won't go through all of these, but you can see that they're all um, in plus. We're still seeing increases in website consumers, repeat cons consumer rates, and um, the net promoter score is still at 78, which really is world class. Um, for that business. So just quickly, the Hampers and Gifts Australia business is broken up into two parts, which is the Hamper Emporium, which is purely Hampers and makes up 75% of that business. And then Gifts Australia, which makes up 25% of the business, which is um, gifting um, some Hampers as well, but a really good big focus on personalization around in-house in engraving and embossing, which is really starting to grow as well. You can see here for that first quarter, there was growth in its website, customers, um, repeat purchase rates. Its net promoter score is also excellent and um, getting new consumers in. So I'm touching on some of the assets that that business has. Now looking at Paris Creek Farms. Paris Creek Farms, um, has had a bit of, as I said, a, a sales growth year to date um, has, been, has been flat, 
Um, but been, we've been working really hard to increase the, um, the growth potential of our branded products. In March 2021, we stopped doing some unprofitable um, private label business with the view of focusing on our Paris Creek Farms branded product. And um, we've just been lucky enough to be awarded um, a business with Woolworths, which we'll see us launch into 400 stores um, in New South Wales and Victoria um, in March 2022. So this is going to be fantastic for the brand and really start to bro branch out into that national um, ranging um, that we've been looking for under the Paris Creek Farms brand. We were also already sell our cheese um, nationally through Coles and Woolworths um, and this will be an opportunity to get three of our milk skews um, into, into the eastern seaboard. Um, we launched our new Greek style yogurts which are selling really well and they're also getting ranged in New South Wales now in Woolworths. Um, so things looking really positive for the Paris Creek Farms brand and I think that being a biodynamic organic brand, which is um, a very regenerative farming practice. Um, we're working with our farmers to become carbon neutral by the time we launch in March 2022. And um, we're very on trend with the retailers at the moment as they also strive to reach their um, carbon neutral targets. So St. David Dairy um, continued to show really great strength and brand resilience, even through the lockdowns in um, Q1 FY22. This business has been amazing. Um, throughout the lockdowns, it's continued to be profitable, um, to show sales growth, um, as well as to be cash flow positive. And um, it's starting now to, to grow back into New South Wales again after it's come out of lockdown. And we're going to be launching new yogurts for that business, as well as um, uh, hopefully pushing further um, into some other areas of um, to that into the Sydney market. So that we're really excited about the growth that we'll be able to achieve with this business now that we are um, out of lockdown and hopefully that will continue and um, the St. David dairy brand will continue to grow. One of the things we've been able to do with this business during lockdown is we've been able to pivot further into retail. So the retail component of this business now makes up about 25% um, of its sales and um, we, can, we plan to continue to grow this further um, with the core cafe business direct to store model that we have also growing as well. So as mentioned, there's been, there's been a lot of change over the past couple of years since I took over the CEO role in October, November 2019, but it's been really fantastic to see the changes and the um, and the transformation of the business. So we've, we've moved out of, um, uh, I guess, rebuilding mode, and we've now moved into growth mode, um, very much into growth mode. Um, the business is back into profitability, um, at EBITDA and this year at NPAT as well. And um, it, it's really exciting about the, the future prospects that we've got with the combined um, firepower of the Maggie B Holdings and HGA business. Um, we've got a lot of plans to further grow out the e-commerce channel um, with um, HGA and uh, we'll see some of those roll out over the next 12 months. And we've got um, a lot of plans for growing out the Maggie View products range in particular um, with extra ranging in, in Australia and overseas. So we've got a really clear plan now for double digit growth. Um, the board is, um, is functioning very well. We've got the new Dredge, our new chair has been there now since March 2020 and, um, and we're really achieving some great things. So we've got increased ranging new products that we're going to be developing and launching, um, growing our e commerce business um, over the next 12 months and onwards and we'll be investing further in our marketing. And with a strong balance sheet and um, $30 million in cash and at the end of the Q1 and $3 million in undrawn debt facilities to support that expected growth, um, we we are really excited about the future and um, are looking forward to sharing the journey with our, our shareholders and employees. Uh, thanks, Chantal. Um, <clears throat> I might just kick off with a, a question or two here just to get the, the ball oh. rolling. Um, can we... Can you maybe talk, I know it might be a little premature, but how you see seasonality affecting the business now that you've got HGA uh, in there in terms of first half split versus uh, second half split? Um, can you maybe just talk to, talk to where you think that might land after we you know, come out the other side in, uh, in January? 
Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, the so yeah, definitely the HGA business is very seasonal. It does um, a large amount of its business in the October to December quarter, that gifting period. So look, I, I imagine that the sales split um, as well, we're estimating at the moment, it'll probably be about 60% in the first half and 40% in the second half. Um, the Maggie Bee products business used to be a lot more season, seasonal as well, but with the launch of our cheese range and the cooking stocks range um, and some other everyday products, we have seen that flatten out. And that's what we're going to be doing with HGA as well. So there's a real focus on, and we're locking away now, um, uh, uh, items, new hampers and ranges for Mother's Day, um, as well as increasing our baby hamper gifting range um, and also things like um, other gifting for other occasions, like when people buy new houses and dealing with real estate agents. So there's a lot, a lot of opportunities to us to smooth that out, but there will always be a large amount of business for the HGA business in that October to December quarter. And then um, <clears throat> as you kind of, you know, move more to this direct to consumer piece within HGA and you know Maggie Beer itself uh, and indeed with uh, Paris Creek um where do you where do you see kind of GP margins kind of heading over the the medium term as that kind of sales mix which was historically very wholesale based tends to drift more to consumer but obviously the, the wholesale will still be a big part of it. Yeah, look, definitely. So look, retail will always be a big part of it. And we've got, um, we'll continue to have, um, uh, to grow that side of the business. Um, but definitely look, as the direct to consumer model increases, and as now I said, it, it's now sort of about 40% um, of the, the group's revenue, um, we'll, we'll see that gross margin improve. Um, the gross margin that we can achieve from that direct to consumer side of the business is, is, is higher than what we can um, achieve from the retail side because we, we, we don't have the retailers margins in the middle. So, um, so that's something that's really exciting. And we're already seeing that sort of um, to that, that come to fruition at the moment. And, um, and again, I think one of the things like the Maggie Beer products business, the direct consumer side of that at the moment, like we're seeing, um, uh, as I mentioned, 150 odd percent growth. And, and that's what it is off a smaller base than what HGA has got. But we, we really do believe that um, we can make the Maggie Beer products e commerce side of the business um, a similar size and continue to grow that to where HGA is. There's just a lot of, um, a lot of room there for growth. A uh, couple of questions from the audience, Chantel. Uh, first one, impact of cost inflation and ability to, to push that through into prices, I guess, yeah, inflation, mm. uh, whether it's wages or for, for you guys, you know, direct commodities, wh whatever it might be, um, it's a topic uh, we see coming up a lot. So maybe if you can uh, check on, uh, give us a, a health check on where you are with that. Yeah, look, like all businesses, um, so I guess from the retail side, we have seen some cost pressures um, from some of our suppliers. And at the moment, we've been able to um, we've absorb those with efficiencies that we've got in the in the businesses, particularly, I guess, on the Maggie Beer side of the, the business. Um, but um, but look, we are constantly reviewing that and um, in discussions with our retail partners. Um, and um, if we need to put price increases through um, on our products into the retail side of the market, that's something that we'll, we'll look at. Um, and on the uh, the direct to consumer side of the business, and I guess that's another one of the um, the positives for that side of the business is that we can really um, we can sort of dictate the price. So that is much easier for us. It's a premium product, um, and it's great a great consumer value with the hampers that we we do. We can pass on price increases if we need to in that side of the business quite easily. We have seen, um, as all businesses, we do bring in some packaging and um, from uh, from overseas. So we have seen some increases in, in costs um, from some of those imports. We bought in a lot of our packaging sort of uh, sort of in August and September. Um, so uh, we sort of got those in a little bit earlier, but things that we're bringing in now for Q1, we have seen some increases, but at the moment it's not a uh, material impact on, um, on gross margin or uh, EBITDA, um, but we obviously monitoring it very closely. We're lucky because we, we buy predominantly Australian food products, particularly for Maggie Bee products in Paris Creek and St. David Dairy. Um, all of our, our products are sourced locally, so we don't, um, we don't get any impact from those cost pressures um, from importing from overseas. 
And another question from the audience, Anna, you have touched on it a bit, but uh, how much product integration over time do you see between Maggie Beer Group products and the uh, and the hampers? I guess. Uh, yeah. Can, so look, we were. Able, if I, if, yeah, sorry. Is it is it a case <laughs> if you don't want you know to be uh, completely cannibalizing where you've got you know. Uh, Maggie beer products and the hampers and gifts are basically one in the same in terms of the offering in both. Look, that's right. And I think, um, so look, the Maggie beer product range is quite, it's quite large. And um, we've been able to put about approximately 10 of the Maggie beer products range um, into the, the Hampers and Gifts Australia range um, initially. So um, we bought the, the, the we finalised the purchase in May and we have to lock away all of our Christmas hampers really um, at the end of July. So it was a very quick turnaround. Um, so, but we'll always have a difference between the two, the two hamper ranges. They'll still run as two separate businesses. So it will definitely be some products in there. Um, probably it will be a few more than what we've got at the moment, but it won't be, they will never mirror each other. But one of the things that we've also been able to do um, is we're able to develop five or six exclusive products between the Maggie Beer products and HGA businesses. So their products aren't available anywhere else. Um, and so we'll continue to, um, to make those exclusive products that will only be available in the HGA and Maggie Beer products e-commerce business, um, which I think is going to be really exciting. Um, and then another question uh, from me. Um, are you looking at any other Australian-based premium food brands that you know could be a good fit into the group where you know you they would benefit from your relationships on the wholesale side and obviously uh now with the hampers and gift side that have would be something that could uh, work in either or both but just the scale of the distribution would like really benefit that product whereas where the business is now maybe run by two entrepreneurs uh they it would take them a long time to get to the level of distribution that you have? Mm. Yeah, look, we're not looking at anything at the moment, but um, there's there's definite opportunity um, if the right type of business um, um, I came across our desk for us to look at and if it was something that we could put, put, it, put through into the business and run through the retail side of the model um, as well as through the direct-to-consumer side of the business, then we would definitely look at it because you, you, you're you right and I think that's what's so exciting is that um, we've got national ranging and distribution um fully set up now for um, the, the retail side. And now we've got this um, very um, optimised um, operational um, business for the, the hampers and gifts side of the business as well. So it does allow us to, um, to have a, a really um, large amount of touch points across um, Australia and hopefully internationally as well as we, we grow out. And then just a, a question on the impact of the cafes and restaurants reopening in New South Wales and Victoria, has the level of activity maybe surprised you or is it, you know, people are just getting back to getting back to normal and it's th the ramp up that you expected? Yeah, look, it's really interesting, and it happened back in March as well, um, is that as soon as it reopened, um, uh, we saw business pick up almost immediately and businesses placing order in anticipation of that opening up. Um, in March earlier this year, we had our biggest weeks ever in between that sort of that small opening window in Melbourne, and we've, and we've seen it come back definitely in, in Melbourne and also New South Wales um, uh, almost immediately for the, the cafe and restaurant. The Melbourne CBD, um, the cafes there are still um, not trading fully, but those businesses haven't been there for the St. David Dairy business for a while now, but the retail part has picked that up. So um, yeah, so it, it's really exciting to see um, those those cafes opening again. Okay, Chantel, we're just up on time. So I think we'll just leave it there because I do know uh, John, our next presenter is patiently waiting in the <laughs> wings. So thank you very much for your presentation this morning and joining us and uh, good luck with the rest of the uh, crazy Christmas silly season and we yeah look forward yes. to results when they come out in February yeah no problem thank you and um, I hope I didn't go talk too quickly there's a lot to get through with the four businesses so if anyone has any questions um, feel free to send them to Mark and I'm happy to answer them offline so thanks very much thanks Chantel uh, and then if you could stop sharing your screen please and we will then move on to our second presenter who should be no stranger to 
Coffee Microcaps uh, followers. This is his, I think, third presentation. We've had him at one of our in-person events when they were still a thing, and uh, one of our online events, John Thompson from Gnosis. Uh, can see you coming up now, John. Yeah, if you just want to go to full, perfect. There we go. Right. Thanks very much, Mark. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to everyone again. Uh, the slide deck I've produced really is sort of in three parts. Uh, first, to give an introduction to Gnosis for people who perhaps uh, we haven't spoken to or haven't seen us before. Uh, a bit of an overview of the business uh, as it exists today. And then uh, looking at you know, what we consider to be our growth uh, pathway as we go forward. So I'll kick into it if you like. So what is the vision mission of Gnosis? Fundamentally, you know, we really believe in the old adage that um, yeah, information is power. And we add to that, that information and knowledge is power. And organizations need to connect to that information to be productive, to uh, provide better engagement with their customers and uh, applications of that nature. So this is where we really exist within the marketplace. So if we look at what the underlying drivers are uh, for Gnosis and our solutions, uh, the first one, obviously, which you're all aware of is remote workers. Now, there was a trend uh, within all industries uh, to go towards remote working, uh, hybrid type models, uh, really over the past five years uh, as such. Obviously, the... Uh, servicing of COVID over the last two years has really heightened that. So organizations have people uh, who are remote. How do they connect? How do they engage with them? How do they make them be able to do their jobs as such? This process has always heightened the use of uh, digital channels with their customers. Uh, so their customers are coming at those businesses through their websites more uh, or through their calling up the business etc. So we saw uh, an increased need for our solutions, particularly for businesses wanting to have a really good customer engagement, consistent messaging to their end customers. We also have found the underlying driver for our solutions is governance and compliance with people working remotely. Uh, there, particularly in the industries we work within, uh, there is a high requirement for making sure that you know, the information that's shared with end customers, the processes, the procedures, the advice a, a business uh, employee is using is correct, accurate, and more importantly, can be audited. And finally, the underlying driver for a lot of our solutions is simply content explosion. I mean, the last 10 years, the amount of information, and I separate information from data. Data is, you know, rows and columns. Information is things that are contained within documents, procedural things, or held within people's heads. So that's really grown over the years, as we've seen. So therefore, what have we done about this? Well, we've developed fundamentally and provide you know, three really, you know, what I think are quite amazing solutions. Uh, the first is our knowledge management solution, Knowledge IQ. Uh, the next one is our Green Orbit which is our employee experience platform. And then the most recent solution uh, that we're marketing is Libero, which is our library automation and customer member um, access solution. So they're the three solutions. These are all SaaS solutions that we uh, uh, deploy into cloud environments and offer to our end customers. So if I look at what's the commonality between a lot of our solutions, well, look, it, it, it's pretty simple, really. Um, obviously, the biggest thing with so much information is search. Uh, a lot of employees and a lot of customers spend a lot of time searching for information and answers. So a lot of our platforms have a core commonality, which is what we call intelligent search. So that's basically anticipating what people are looking for, uh, being able to bring back the same response, irrespective of how that person query, you know, what you may type in a question in terms of the words you use may be different to me. What our platforms try to do is make sure we deliver back to you the same uh, so that you see what I see. 
The other aspect to it is personalization, which is a really big thing these days in a lot of uh, technology sectors. We want to deliver a personalized experience with so much information out there. We want to you know, curtail it, uh, reduce it to what people require to do their jobs, uh, to interact with customers. So personalizing how the information is delivered to you as an individual is a key aspect to all the platforms. Uh, relevancy is the next aspect. There's always new information being created uh, in a particular business and just generally speaking. When that new information is created, you know, how do we know as a user that that uh, new information exists and it's related to things I'm already aware of. So the solutions look at new information created and make sure that I as an individual are delivered that information and are aware it exists, which is really important. And then I get back to governance. Uh, we hop, operate generally in highly regulated industries and therefore the ability for an organization to know what people are using through extensive audit trials and making sure that people only get access to what they're allowed to. Uh, the four core capabilities within all of our platforms, and that's what ties them together. So just to briefly go through uh, the solutions, our knowledge management solution is the one that we started out with as an organization. Uh, it's been our core platform. Uh, we have somewhere in the order of you know, close to 50,000 licensed users on this, and it's all about delivering answers and information, particularly to contact center support operations. And it's also about delivering that information to the end customer through a company's website, web portals. So basically it's a single source of truth. So your employees, your customers can ask questions, query things and get the right answers back. So it's very high performance, generally operates within the enterprise space and we have you know, cornerstone customers um, operating this system. In terms of our employee experience platform, this is all about you know, how you enable your employees to communicate and collaborate and engage with what the business wants them to see and work with as such. So it's really creating that you know, really inspiring, really um, you know, communicative type experience. Uh, so particularly in today's world with remote working, how do we engage employees? How do we make sure they're up to date with what's happening? How do they access you know, certain information? And this platform is very much uh, directed towards employee engagement and employee productivity. So it's really great for this time in the remote working and really good because we see this uh, mode of operation continuing for many years ahead. The third solution we offer is our library service platform. Now this solution is really designed to help uh, librarians, uh, operators of libraries to manage their information assets within the library, but more importantly, to automate the internal operations so that it's very efficient, very productive from that point of view. But the new trend with this solution is really about how do we enable members to access all that information remotely uh, as opposed to walking into the library as what they used to do uh, you know, many years ago. So the platform has really evolved now into once again, enabling members to search, to find uh, what they're looking for, to understand who the member is, you know, what they've looked at previously. I like to call it you know, the Netflix um, type experience so that the system actually promotes you know, relevant things that they may be interested in looking at and inquiring. So they're the three SaaS solutions that we uh, deliver. As I think I mentioned, we initially started out with one, we now have three, and we're really focused on growing this out. So when the business started uh, five years ago, quite frankly, we had one customer uh, in Melbourne and we had a staff of less than five. Uh, where Gnosis is today, uh, five years later, we've got over 380 customers, we've got 380,000 licensed users, and we have solutions across 10 plus countries across the globe. Also as a business, we've scaled, we've scaled out of Melbourne, we now have five offices, 
uh, throughout the world, uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, in the uh, UK, and obviously our offices within Australia. We've also grown employees. We have 60 uh, employees now, and we have almost 30% you know, of our staff is focused on R&D and product development to continue to enhance those solutions. So in terms of our customers, we generally operate uh, within the following sectors. Banking and finance uh, was our first uh, segment that we really you know, cut our teeth on. Uh, we evolved and migrated into communications and entertainment. And now we have now morphed into health and legal and also government. So as you can see, we've got quite an interesting group of client base, and this is just a, a sample of those customers uh, across the portfolio. In terms of our market, uh, basically our market for our solutions is valued at about 29 billion. Uh, the employee experience, the Green Orbit solution is the largest market uh, because obviously that's a very horizontal solution across all industries. Our knowledge management system, very good market at 2 billion, uh, very much targeted at enterprise, large companies. And then our library management uh, solution, very much once again, similar to knowledge management, uh, councils, government, uh, enterprise, corporate libraries. So we've got a good mix of what we call mid-market and what we call enterprise customers that we try to address. So to give you some breakdown of that, you can see in our employee experience, we normally, it's a mid-market product. We normally sell this into companies that have 200 to 1,000 employees. And it generally has a sales cycle of three to six months. Um, knowledge management is very much enterprise, 1,000 to 10,000, much longer sales cycle, but a higher value, of course. And then we obviously have the library system, which once again is mid-market, normally staff about 200 to 300 staff in a sales cycle, nine to 12 months. So as you can see, we've got a good spread. And the reason for that is to smooth out between the big enterprise deals and have business activity in between those. So in terms of where we are going as a business going forward, our strategic goals for uh, 2024 are very simple. You know, we wanna increase our customers to over a thousand plus customers in the next three years. Uh, we want to increase our user base to over a million licensed users over the next three years. And we want to be recognized as a leading vendor in the particular verticals that we operate, that is knowledge management, employee experience, and library uh, management systems. So in terms of where we are from a, an operating point of view, uh, you can see here, this is a summary of our FY21 results. So we grew our recurring revenue 28% uh, uh, during the course of FY21. We grew our total operating revenue by 46% uh, during that year. And then, look, that's an excellent result given the impact of COVID uh, on the general market. Um, we've been very resilient uh, during that period. And uh, a lot of all of our customers have stayed with us and we've had the opportunity to grow. In terms of where we got to, we had a three-year plan three years ago to get to a break-even position. We've achieved that as of FY21. If we back out our acquisition cost, we're basically operationally break-even, which is where we wanted to be. And we ended the year with a really good um, cash in the bank of over 6.5 million. But I think the interesting chart here is the right-hand chart on our recurring revenue. As you can see, we've got a history of growing recurring revenue and we are accelerating that uh, as we sit here today. At the end of July, we probably had a ARR of somewhere around six, just over six million projected. Um, as of this moment in time, we're exceeding eight million in ARR projected. So we're on our way to what we see as uh, 10 million in ARR to break that barrier. And then once we've broken that barrier, we're going to go towards the 20 million. And that's our aspirations you know, as a business as we go forward. Um, in order to achieve that, we've got a five uh, pillar strategy. The first one is with all these customers, we wanna grow the revenue that we're getting from our existing customer base. It's much harder to acquire new customers. So you need to really focus on that. So we have a target of growing 
the revenues from the existing target base, the customer base of 20%. Uh, and we're doing this by increasing our investment in our account management, but also looking at cross-sell opportunities within the customer base. So customers who buy one or more of our solutions, we tend to do a packaged uh, offering for them, which is beneficial to them and beneficial to us. So real focus on upsell in terms of additional licenses, increasing our license too, as we add functionality. And that's the growth we're getting from the existing customers. New customers, we're very much focused on growing uh, our sales in our geographic regions. Our two main targets are the US, uh, where we have a very good um, solid customer base. We're going to introduce uh, our knowledge management product into the US market over the next 12, 24 months, as well as looking at the opportunity to introduce the library solution there. And US market is uh, the largest for both those solutions uh, from a geographic segmentation point of view. We also have a very good footprint in Germany with our library management system. We've got over 70 customers in there and we plan to expand uh, our library solution on adjacent countries uh, growing out of Germany. So to achieve this, we're investing a lot more now in our sales and our pre-sales uh, resources, uh, in our marketing to support those growth initiatives uh, in those particular two geographic markets. We're also investing in and brought on a new digital marketing team to really push the Gnosis brand and our um, solution brands into those markets. And that's been, a, and we're already seeing the benefits of that uh, work over the last quarter uh, in terms of inbound leads and recognition of the company. We also continue, which is very important in any technology company to invest in the product and solution. And we uh, continue to invest in those core four areas of search. There's how do we improve that? adding more AI and machine learning to it, relevancy, and adding those core capabilities to the platforms. So that's a really important part of our strategy. And then of course, we're looking, and we continue to look at um, M&A opportunities, particularly those within our particular core segments. So employee experience in the knowledge management sector or in the library um, service platform sector. So we continue to look at opportunities to uh, grow our recurring revenue through SaaS businesses. And that's a, once again, a focus for the business over the next uh, 12, 24 months as well. So in terms of investment opportunity, you know, we're very much a digital workplace company. We're a SaaS vendor. Uh, therefore, recurring revenue is a key metric for us, but also so is gross margin at the moment. You know, we are averaging in the high 80s in terms of our gross margin. And that gives you a view of the value of the SaaS uh, business model that we encourage. We're in a, uh, a large addressable market. You know, we don't say we can get all of that, of course, but that those markets are growing individually between 12 and 18% per annum. So we think we're in a good space. Uh, we are focused very much uh, in the next 12, 24 months on organic growth. Uh, of our businesses into those geographic regions, but we will also be supplementing that potentially with acquisitions uh, as we go forward. We invest in innovative technologies, intelligent search, machine learning, natural language processes that keeps our products relevant, but also enables us to hopefully you know, charge more for the solutions because of their greater capabilities and value to the end customers. Uh, as you can see, we've got a very diversified customer base. Uh, we have enterprise customers and we have large number of mid-market customers. That gives us that diversification and reduces the risk uh, for us as a business. And obviously our focus continues to be on SaaS uh, revenue uh, model. And that's where we, as an organization, see the value in Gnosis uh, going forward. So in terms of at a glance, you can see at the moment, uh, we have about two, just over 200 million shares on issue, which I think is you know, quite a small number. We've been very prudent in our capital raising as anyone who's tracked the business. Uh, we've always managed the business looking at the bottom line uh, as such. And we think we're in a really good position at the moment with our cash. And important part too is that 
all the directors, executives and staff have a reasonable large percentage of the company because we like to align that within the business as such. So in terms of uh, just finishing off where we're going, obviously we've achieved our initial strategic objectives was growing the business to be an, an operational break even. The next one to two years, three years is all about now we have a sufficient scale, we've got um, the employees, we have the offices, we have the large customer base. It's now about growing. And our focus is investing in growth and we'll invest in new resources, marketing, sales, to really break through that 10 mil barrier and get us towards the 20 mil plus, which is what we hope to be you know, in the next three years. So look, that's it for me. Uh, look, I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, obviously, if you have any questions post this meeting, more than happy for you to reach out to either Katie or myself. So I'll hand it back to uh, Mark. Thanks, John. We've had a flurry of questions, but I just want to get to one that was emailed in earlier because uh, the uh, person couldn't join us uh, for the live event, but they did indicate they're going to watch it back on YouTube. So I'll start with that one. Uh, the company mentioned it was waiting for customer decisions on two enterprise deals. Uh, how long have they been in the making? And could you walk us through the pipeline conversion process for second, uh, sorry, for seven figure enterprise deals like these? Okay, yes. Look, the, uh, I think as we updated in our 4C, uh, one of the interesting things we saw during COVID was a transition on how people were evaluating platforms, particularly in the enterprise space. Uh, they've moved to pilots. So basically, they wanted to pilot solutions uh, to try before buy concept, as it were. And this was pretty unusual. I hadn't seen that in the previous years. So yes, we, uh, during the last 12 months, nine to 12 months, have implemented and conducted pilots as we've advised the market. Uh, all of those pilots completed um, you know, a month or two ago as such. And as I mentioned, we are waiting the decision on that. We're, you know, we're relatively confident of uh, getting an outcome from the three uh, pilots of some nature, uh, but we expect to know that um, the outcome from that uh, this quarter. So by hopefully by Christmas, we'll have a view as to what's happening with you know, one, two, three of those activities. So generally that's the change we've seen is people are conducting three, three month, you know, four month pilots, doing evaluation, uh, a lot of surveying of uh, their, their employees in terms of how they found it, um, ease of use, all those type of uh, things. And then they use that as part of the decision process uh, from that point of view. So from that point of view, yeah, we're, we're reasonably happy where we are, those pilots. We've also, uh, from a pipeline point of view, and that's for knowledge management, um, which is the main enterprise one, We've had a, a number of mid-market opportunities also in knowledge management, which we believe we will be quite successful in over the quarter as well with the, in that. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, so enterprise normally, as I think I indicated in the slide deck, uh, can be a 12 month process, um, depending upon the end customer uh, as such. Okay, and then uh, I'll take some of these ones from the audience. Um, what additional costs are required to generate 10 to 20 million a annual recurring revenue? Is it addition in sales, investment in product, a combination of all of that? Look, the, the truth of the answer to that is it's probably a combination, but in reality, the majority of the investment is in sales and marketing. In the sales side of it, it's uh, about, uh, yeah, more resources in terms of people uh, on the ground who are working with customers, taking them through the journey, uh, you know, taking them particularly as a, a trusted advisor type approach. So it's additional sales resources, it's additional pre-sales, uh, people wanting uh, to be supported in terms of how we roll out the program, how the technology integrates with our cloud 
um, strategies, things of that nature. So sales, resources, pre-sales, resources, and then marketing um, in the business, uh, particularly Green Orbit. Uh, it's very much an inbound business. So digital marketing is the key driver for success in that space. So we're talking about larger investment in uh, digital marketing, in you know, Google ads, uh, SEO, things of that nature. So they're the biggest areas of investment to achieve the growth is resources in those areas um, as such. The product and technology, uh, we've enhanced the, and put on more people in the development teams, but not significantly. We haven't like tripled the size of the development team. So it's very much sales and marketing is the focus for investment. Okay, great. And then another question from the audience, can you give a broad range in terms of what we should expect the different products to grow revenue at? Um, I think the question might be more directed about what price increases you can push through in each of the three products. Is it CPI, CPI plus, or you know, what the customer can bear or, or how yep. are they kind of contract linked up front? Yeah. No, look, that's a really good question. Uh, some of our, we have a mixture uh, of contracts within the organization. Uh, most of our contracts at a minimum include an annual increase. Uh, that annual, annual increase in some solutions might be CPI, but it, uh, in others, it may be you know, a fixed increase from anywhere from five to 10% uh, as such. Uh, but what we're generally doing is our preferred method is to uh, add new capabilities to each of the solutions. So when it comes to the anniversary of the contract or the contract renewal, we're in a position to talk with the customer about an increase, which you know, may exceed that five or 10% based on we've enhanced the product. This is the value to you. Uh, and that's how we generally do the uplift in pricing. So uh, we are certainly with existing customers, when they come for renewal, we look at the opportunity to promote the benefits of the solution and get a larger increase. Uh, obviously, you know, we have an internal target, as we've uh, mentioned in our slide decks. We want to grow the business you know, double digit and we need existing customers and new customers to be aligned with that. Uh, year on year as we go forward. And then a question I think uh, probably stemming from the, the international expansion. Uh, can you please ask about the implementation for each customer site, how much support is required? So I guess, um, yep. yeah, do you need technicians on the ground uh, to act particular sites to grow um, internationally and I guess in a kind of COVID restricted way? Yep, no, really good question. Uh, it's probably one of the ad advantages of having SaaS based solutions is that, you know, by their very nature, they're designed to be able to onboard customers in uh, a small amount of time without the need for physical presence as such. So the reality is we are onboarding customers around the globe as we sit here today, uh, based out of you know, Melbourne, and based of our, uh, out of our Indian operations. So we virtually uh, can onboard customers, particularly in green orbit, um, very quickly. Normally takes, uh, onboarding is anywhere from two to four weeks as such, but our actual man effort uh, is only in reality two to three days to onboard a customer. And that can be done remotely. Uh, library management, uh, Libero, very similar. Uh, we onboard customers, we've onboarded all the German customers as an example, remotely. And once again, it's a, you know, it can be a you know, four week to eight week total program. But in terms of our resources, it's only in the three to four days. So the solutions don't take a lot of manpower to actually onboard customers uh, realistically, uh, which is really good. And that's how we keep the gross margin high and we're able to scale it. Knowledge management, mid-market, very similar process. We have a, a five-day onboarding process uh, for most of our mid-market customers. In the higher enterprise, that's a bit different. You know, there can be a lot of professional services, as people would have seen when we did Optus and Sintel. 
you know, those professional services range from, you know, half a million dollars to three quarters of a million dollars because they were run as enterprise projects with huge amounts of project management and engineering management. So they're a little bit different. Bulk of our customers are really within that five day window of resources. So that enables us to scale. So we just need to get new customers and we, we can bring them on board pretty quickly. Uh, John, if you don't have a 10 a.m., I'd like to squeeze in two more questions in the next five Certainly. minutes, if, it's, if that's okay. Not a problem. Okay, so the first one, does Gnosis see its longer term strategy as a software roll up business akin to, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Constellation Software in Canada? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, uh, I know Constellation you know, reasonably well. I've actually sold some businesses into that organization. Uh, the strategy is a little bit different. Constellation works on you know, um, having a large number of businesses. Um, which operate independently and separately. Uh, very good at the financial operational management. Uh, and to all intents purposes, they're almost like a listed private equity group with you know, 200 plus investments. Uh, I've noticed of late, they're starting to merge those businesses a little bit uh, and or group them. Uh, Gnosis's view is we're not operating individual businesses because the businesses we believe were subscale by themselves. So our philosophy is we look at businesses where they have the same technology stack so that we can have one software development group looks after it. Uh, they have similar markets whereby a common sales team can sell the solutions and that there's overlap in the markets so that we get cross sell opportunities. Uh, with that, and that relates to the marketing, et cetera. So we see, see ourselves as a software company that offers multiple SaaS solutions, uh, but not separated out into individual business units um, as such. Now, it's not to say if we had a business that took off tremendously and you know, outgrew you know, its um, you know, brother and sister, businesses, we wouldn't look at something of that nature. But as we sit here, we see uh, growing scale and having common core services that deliver the solutions uh, to uh, the end customers. And then the final one, and then we let you go, John. Uh, can you talk about typical contract value across the three products? And if I might just reinterpret that question slightly, if we can look ahead at, as say, you know, What's the kind of average seat license cost within each of the three? And then the average kind of contract length, you know, whether it's month to month, annual renewals are on a, on a multi-year basis. Maybe if you just break down how, how the, that would work across the three. Yeah, look, um, probably the easiest way is I look at sort of average contract value across the solutions. So if we look at um, the Green Orbit, our experience solution that generally contracts out on a one year or a three year contract term in terms of average contract value you know that really sits between sort of 10 and twenty thousand uh, dollars a customer uh, per annum uh, is the average annual contract value uh, for them if i look at the uh, libero solution in the library space uh, that's a bit different. That's normally, once again, that generally is a three-year to five-year contract. Uh, his, history has shown that those contracts last 10 to 15 years. So it's a really sticky, really good space. Uh, the average contract value in that sector is anywhere from probably about $30,000 to $80,000 uh, um, average contract value per annum that you get from that particular solution. And then the knowledge management one, uh, that's a little bit different because obviously a lot of our success has been in enterprise with that. Uh, the uh, contract value in that space is generally three to five years uh, as such. And in terms of average contract value, well, that can vary from you know, 250,000 a year in the enterprise space to over a million 
uh, dollars a year, depending upon the size of the organization. Okay, John, we've gone five minutes over time. So thank you for accommodating us with the, those last few questions. And I, I don't even think we managed to squeeze them all in, but if anybody does have further questions, uh, please reach out to John or indeed reach out to Katie. Um, we've uh, hopefully had uh, plenty of opportunities to note down the, the email addresses there. And uh, I'd just like to thank John for coming back in and giving us an update. And yeah, we look forward to keeping an eye on things over the next couple of months. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. And with that, I'm going to end this morning's meeting and uh, wish everyone a good rest of their Thursday.